Okay, welcome to Mice Tech Talk with technical information scientists at the Jackson Laboratory. My name is Pete, and my job as a technical information scientist is to serve the research community by answering all your mouse-related research questions. For any of you that are watching live, you can use the comment section of the video to tell us where you're viewing from and any related questions you have, and we will try to answer those for you live if we can. So today, let's talk designing genotyping assays. And to help me answer your questions, I'm joined by my colleague, Jen. Hi, everyone. I'm the manager of the Model Generation Genotyping Service here at the Jackson Laboratory. My group is responsible for designing all of the genotyping assays for strains at Jax. And just to provide a little bit of context, genotyping actually is the number one topic that we get asked about in TIS. A lot of people struggle to understand how genotyping assays work and what is actually being genotyped for. So Jen, when we bring in a new strain to the Jackson Laboratory, why does Jax often develop a new assay? Why do we not always use the same one as the donating investigator who made the strain and gave it to Jax? Well, Pete, our laboratory is a high throughput laboratory and we genotype over 45,000 samples per week. Um, so we need our assays to perform well with our equipment and protocols. It's very important that each of these assays are as specific as possible since we have closely related mutations. Um, to answer the second part of your question, there can be many reasons why we don't use the same primary primers as the donating investigator. Perhaps they're not specific or the primers don't have the right annealing temperature or they simply don't perform well with our conditions. All right, so when you're designing a new assay, what resources do you consult to design a unique set of primers? Well, <laughs> these are good questions. And in order to fully explain, I wanna walk you through the process I use to design any new genotyping assay. I'll start at the beginning and I'll show you all of the databases I use and how I use them. And hopefully by the end of the presentation, everyone will have a better understanding of this process. So in order to do this, I picked, picked a strain we distribute here at Jax, which has a LOX-P flanked allele of MYD88. Now, just for everyone um, listening, links to all of the websites I will be using will be made available in the description of this video. So while you're pulling up those websites, Jen, let me explain to our audience what a LOX-P flanked or flox allele is. These are mutations that are generated for use with the CreLock system, which allow researchers to create tissue-specific knockouts or mutations. Okay, so um, the allele I'm interested in today is this allele of MYD88, TM1DEFR. The first place I'd like to start is MGI. So all you have to do is put the name of your allele into this quick search function box, hit quick search, the symbol will be here. And what I focus on primarily are the mutation details. They'll tell you a lot about um, the mutations present in this strain. The primary thing to know about this strain is that exon 3 is flanked by LOXP sites. Now the primary publication is a really useful thing to have when you're trying to understand a mutation. And what's nice about MGI is they put the primary publication right here as a hyperlink um, in the mutation details section. So you can simply click on that and it will bring you to um, the primary publication and you just click over PubMed ID and you can download the paper here. Now I've already done that for today um, and I've read the paper and I know that um, for this particular, in this particular paper, that's the supplemental materials contain the information that tells us the most about the generation of this flox allele. So in reading this publication, it tells us that a conditional allele of MYD88 was created. Exon three of the mouse MYD88 gene was targeted. and that a LOXP site was inserted into an HPA1 site upstream of exon 3, and a LOXP site was inserted into an NSI1 site downstream of exon 3. This is very useful information. This is telling you exactly what you need to know in order to design a genotyping assay. So what do we do next, okay? We know where the LOXP sites are located, how do we um, next, what do we next look at to decide what we need to do for primer design? 
One of my absolutely favorite websites is the UCSC Genome Browser. This is a very handy place and I'll show you why. So I'm gonna click on Genome Browser and it automatically puts me on the mouse assembly, but you could certainly, you know, look at human mouse rat, et cetera. But I'm on the most recent mouse assembly and I'm going to enter my gene of interest, which is MYD88. I'm gonna click the top link and there. So what this is showing me is MYD88 is here. It's located on chromosome nine. And what this will allow me to do is download the genomic sequence of MYD88. So I'm simply gonna open that, click on that, and you'll see here genome sequence chromosome nine. I'm gonna click on that. Now I don't know how easy this is for you to see, so I'm gonna explain it a little bit. Um, you can download um, the entire gene sequence, including a promote the promoter sequence, downstream sequence. You can set how much you want to download on either side of the gene. I typically go for the five prime untranslated ex region exons, coding sequence, three prime untra untranslated region, and introns. And what's really great about this is it allows you to download the sequence with exons in uppercase and everything else in lowercase. And that just gives you a nice visual understanding of what's going on in this gene. So I'm gonna grab the sequence and I'm gonna put it into my favorite program, which is um, a program called Gene Construction Kit. You don't have to use Gene Construction Kit. Other programs that I know people use are Sequencer and SnapGene, for example. Oops, I just hit the wrong button. Excuse me, everybody. You okay? Okay, so I'm gonna paste my sequence here and I'm gonna blow it up nice and big so you can see it. Okay, how does that look, Pete? Can you see the sequence pretty well? A um, little bit bigger? I'm not seeing that it's in Gene Construction Kit yet. I'm still seeing the UCSC. I have it in Gene Construction Kit. Oh, if you're sharing that as an application versus the link, maybe it's not showing up. All right, forgive us everybody for a moment. Just having some technical difficulties. And yeah, maybe you do need to share the whole screen, not just the, your genome browser, your internet browser. There we go. Can you see it now? Yes. Is it big enough? I have a small screen, um, but I think it should be okay. I'll make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so what I like about this is we can see our exons, right? Our exons are in uppercase, our introns are in lowercase. So you remember that the investigator uh, the, uh, it said that uh, exon three was flanked by LOCKS P sites. I don't want you to get too hung up on the exon number. And the reason for that is, um, there can be different transcripts for a gene, and um, also things change. So pu older publications, um, somebody may call exon 1, exon 2, exon 2, exon 1. It, don't get too hung up on, on the exons, because I often find that whatever database you're looking at, um, it may call it exon 3, and the publication calls it Exxon 2. So you wanna actually look for these other landmarks like the restriction sites, which really help you pinpoint which Exxon is flanked by LOCKS-P sites. Now let's make sure we don't have any problem going back to, can we clearly see Ensemble? I can, I can see it. Okay, so Ensemble's a very nice place to go because it will kind of, it will give you um, the exons. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm gonna put in my gene. I'm gonna pick this sequence because it has a coding sequence.
And then I'm going to go look at these exons. So here it actually gives you, so for example, the transcriptional start site is there. So if you wanted to map exon 1, you can figure out exactly where the transcriptional start site is. So I'll go in and put that in here. Okay. And then um, this one is what Ensemble is ca calling exon 3. So we'll go in and we'll make that blue and we'll see what that looks like when we put our restriction sites in. Okay, so I'm making my exons blue now. All right, now, as I said, what you're really gonna wanna be looking for is something like this with the restriction site so that you can really, as I said, use other landmarks rather than the exon number. So we're looking for an HPA1 site and an NSI1 site. And there they are. Here is the HPA1 site. Here is the NSI1 site. So this is the exon that is being targeted in this strain. Okay, so what do we do next? <clears throat> well, you can design around either of the LOXP site locations. It doesn't matter which one you use. So I'm gonna just go ahead and design around the upstream LOXP site. And what I'm gonna do here um, is I'm gonna take it cuts right, HPA1 cuts right here. This is where we expect the LOXP site is located. I'm going to make these a different case, and I'll tell you why in just a couple of minutes. And I'm going to make it black just visually so you can see where that is. All right, so I'm going to just grab sequence upstream and downstream. And I'm going to go to primer three. And I'm going to put this sequence into primer three. And now you can see that I ch where I changed the case is very obvious in primer three. So let's go back and look. I made this a TA uppercase. If this were, if everything was uppercase, I'd make it lowercase, just some sort of visual way so that when you grab this sequence, and put it into primer three, it's easy to see where it is, okay? So primer three is really nice because you can bracket out the regions you don't want considered for primers. So what, what I mean by that is I'm gonna go a little bit upstream just to give it a little bit of room around where that locks P site was inserted. I just like to give it a little bit of space. I don't want my primer right up against um, where that is. So I'm just going to put a bracket here. I'm gonna go 20 or 30 nucleotides downstream and put a bracket here. What this is telling primer three is I don't want you to design a primer anywhere within this bracketed region. I want you to go outside. So that's what it's gonna do. For these LOXP assays, because the LOXP site can be is 34 base pairs and it can be larger or smaller depending on what alterations have occurred when the LOXP site is put into the genome, I want to design for a pretty small product because if you're putting this in agarose gel, you want to be able to resolve the wild type and the mutant products. And, you know, 30 to 40, 50 base pairs, not very easy to resolve as you get into larger um, product sizes. So in this case, I'm going to set um, my product ranges, 130 to 200 base pairs. I'm gonna ask it to return 15 for me, and I'm gonna leave everything else alone. Uh, primer three, you can go in and you can see what the conditions are in primer three. It's a 60 degree annealing temperature. I use this for everything across the board and I just leave the defaults alone. So now I'm gonna pick my primers, okay. So primer three has given me um, the 15 sets of primers that I asked for. And these, I don't think these are in any particular order. I may be wrong, but I don't think it's weighting these in any particular order. So I think that it's just as reasonable to use set one as set 15 on this list. 
What I do like to look for is I like to place a C or G in one of the last two nucleotides of each primer. And that has to do with the hydrogen bonding. I just like to have the three prime end of the primer very tightly bound. So I like to look for that if that's available. If you don't have another option, then just as close as you can to the three prime end. But I like both of these because they both have that. So I'm gonna just grab this first one. And now I wanna make sure it's specific and that it's not gonna cause me any problems with strain background. And I'll explain that more in a minute. I'm gonna go back to my favorite UCSC um, genome browser site, go to tools and blat. And I'm gonna put this primer in here. And what I'm looking for is a single return. So it is telling me that this primer sequence, the only place in the genome with 100% identity is on chromosome nine. Now, if there were more, if these were all stacked up and there were a bunch of them, um, which certainly I do see on a regular basis, then it's not a specific primer, but this primer is looking really specific. And there it is, it maps to MYD88. And when you're here, um, what you wanna do is you also wanna consider this common SNPs um, piece of information that UCSC will give you. You want to move this. You can just simply grab this and move it right below. And what this would show you, and this primer doesn't have it, but I'll find you a primer that does. It would show you if there were any SNPs. And what I'm talking about here is it looks at sequences among um, inbred strains, Castania, Spreadus, others, and looks for any single nucleotide polymorphisms that might be present under this primer. And you want to avoid SNPs. So that way you don't even have to worry about what strain background you have in your mouse. You just know that this is gonna be a primer that for the majority of inbred strains and even some other uh, mouse strains um, isn't gonna have any problems with binding. Okay, so this looks like a really nice primer. It's specific, I don't see any SNPs. So I'm gonna go back to primer three and I'm gonna tell primer three, I like this primer. So I want you to use it and find me a reverse. So now it's going to only use that forward primer and give me options for a reverse primer. So I'm gonna come down here and I, um, I'm going to look at, at the 155 base pair um, because I like a smaller product, especially when I don't know how big um, the mutation is going to be in, in the mutant. So let me look at this guy. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go back into UCSC and I'm going to blat it. This one looks like a good one too. <laughs> Pardon. Again, a single hit and no SNPs, okay? Let's see if we can find us one that has a SNP in just a minute, but I'm gonna call this our primer set. So I'm gonna go back into my sequence and I'm gonna place these in here and I'm gonna make them green because that's my favorite color. So I make all of my primers green. Okay, so here are our primers flanking the HPA1 site, the upstream LOXP site of, X, of the exon of interest, okay? Now, Let's go through and why don't we, if we wanted to try this one, let's see if we have a snip here. I can show you what that looks like, what you want to avoid. This is what a snip looks like right here. So it gives you as a black box. If you were interested in going in and researching the snip, you can. I'm not going to show you um, how to do that today, but you could go in and see which strains are affected by the SNP. If you really needed to use this primer, it might not be a problem, but that's not for today's discussion. All right, so there is our primer set. Okay, okay. So, so what it sounds like is that you 
to design a new assay, you review the original reference for details on where in the gene the mutation was made. Then you find the wild type sequence of the gene. And then you design primers in the region of the gene from what you find in the paper to distinguish the mutant and wild type alleles. Correct. Okay. So just because we're here and you've got this information in front of us, we are often in TIS hast about how to design a genotyping assay to identify the Cre recombined allele. So that would be after deletion. Maybe they want to convert their flox allele to a complete knockout, or they want to monitor for potential germline expression of their tissue specific Cre. Um, sort of briefly, how would they go about doing that? Yeah. So what I'm going to do, just for the sake of showing this as clearly as I can, is I'm going to take this out and I'm going to put it in a new gene construction kit. Can you see gene construction kit right now, Pete? Yes. All right. So let's see. All right. So what you're talking about in that case. So remember, here is our forward primer and our reverse primer. And you're talking about having a Lux P site here and a Lux P site here. And I'm going to make this uppercase in black just so it's a little bit easier to see. All right, let's see if we can't make that a little bit easier to view. There we go. So after Cre recombination, what you're going to be dealing with, and just give me a minute because it's going to be asking me some things about the cut sites, which don't, don't matter for the sake of our discussion today. You're going to end up with this. So this is the recombined allele, where it has removed everything between the two LOX P sites. So you can see that our forward primer sequence is still there, but the area that our reverse primer sequence was is gone. So this assay, this LOX P assay, will not work to genotype for the Cree recombined allele. So in that case, what you want to do, oops, excuse me. go back to this. You're going to want to, this is how I designed for the Cre recombined allele. I put, I make it a four primer assay. I put two wild type primers in the exon that's being removed. And then I put the two mutant primers flanking the recombined site. So this primer is still perfectly fine to use. So you're going to grab this sequence, put it back into primer three, tell it that you're fine with this primer being used, and it will give you a primer downstream of the three prime locks P site. And that's going to be, these are going to be your two mutant specific primers. So you have your two wild type primers within the deleted region, and you have your two mutant primers flanking the um, LOX P sites. Does that make sense? It does to me. Hopefully it does to our audience as well. Thank you, Jen. All right, so we do have a couple questions. Um, we do have somebody also from Bar Harbor listening. Um, actually, it refers to gene construction kit, so which is what you're using to sort of create your, your template and, and changing your cases and colors to map where everything is. Where can somebody else find that? And do you know if it's free to use? Um, there is a demo version. Uh, I'm going to just, I don't know if I should still be sharing my screen or not. Um, I, I'll sh keep sharing just for the time being. So there is a demo version that you can, I think you can just simply Google gene construction kit and you can try that out, but you do have to pay for it. Um, I, you know, it's good for the things that I use it for. I, if you're, if you're wanting to use, if you're wanting to analyze sequence data, if you have other applications of you know beyond what I'm using it for, what I kind of showed you what I'm using it for today, I don't think it's probably right for you. You might want to look at Sequencer or um, uh, what was the other Snap, one? Snap something. Snap Gene. Snap Gene. Okay. 
Sorry, thank you. Um, you're probably going to want to look at that, but I would look at those three. I would look at Sequencher, Snap Gene, Gene Construction Kit, and look at what what um, the features are for each, and then make your decision on that. Okay, I think we got time for maybe one more quick question. Um, what if I can't determine what a primer maps to? Oh yeah, so this is a good question. So um, if you can't determine what a primer maps to, so so often. Uh, in three primer designs, if, if you're somebody that uses our assays a lot um, and you, we have a three primer design where we have a common, a wild type reverse and a mutant reverse, and you're not quite sure what that mutant reverse is. I'm just gonna show you. So neomycin, a neocassette is a very common. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm gonna just grab one of these neo primers that we use on a regular basis and we know what it is, it's a neo primer. but if it were unknown to you, I'll show you what I would use. So I would go to NCBI. So NCBI has over here a BLAST functionality. So you click on BLAST, and you enter that prime, oh, that's not it. Let me try that again. You enter that primer sequence, into BLAST. And it might take a minute. It sometimes takes a, a few minutes to load. But what it will do is it will it will tell you, it'll give you a bunch of hits of, of um, files that you can go in and look at. It will give you the coordinates, coordinates of the primer and you can go within um, the information that's returned and actually figure out that it's a Neo primer. Okay, okay. Great. Great. All right, well, I think that's all the time we have for the questions this week. Um, and we have put the links for all the websites that Jen used today in this video's description. So I want to thank all of you for joining us for the 26th and last Mouse Tech Talk of 2020. Um, but you can join us on Tuesday, January 5th for our next Mouse Tech, Mice Tech Talk. That's called Let's Talk TIS Top 20 Questions. And we look forward to seeing you on LinkedIn and YouTube. And this is Peter. And Jen, staying, stay healthy, stay safe, and stay excited about research.